years ago, and he currently lives in um, Brooklyn together with his wife, who is a doctor too, and with his um, no, 43. am I wrong? 43. 43. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and together, Just on the time. <laughs> 43 years old. Okay, and he currently lives in um, Brooklyn together with his wife and with his four children. He has been recently promoted as Chief of Cardiology at Richmond University Medical Center, where he has been working as a cardiologist since 2007. In 2001, he completed his medical school at the Università degli Studi in Milan, and after that, he continued on with a postgraduate study uh, with a specialization in cardiovascular disease. In 2005, he moved to the United States and after a few years, in 2010, he completed his internal medicine residency program at Richmond University Medical Center. And over the past few months, he has been on the front line uh, fighting the pandemic. And today he's going to tell us how his life as a doctor has changed uh, due to the pandemic. Thank you. It's up to you now. Okay. All right. Very good. So, um, where, where do we start? So, um, a little bit of introduction, of, of course. I mean, the summary was uh, was perfect, uh, except for the age. But uh, that's that's fine. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. for all the for the kids. Uh, I'm very old. So, um, anyway. So, yeah. I, I I started in Milan. I became a doctor in 2001. I uh, I always wanted to be a doctor. I <clears throat> I grew up. Um, in my, my my father was a, he is a cardiologist uh, nowadays still, and um, and uh, I basically I always thought in my life that I was going to be a cardiologist um, uh, because I was seeing that he was living um, a fascinating life, at least for me. Uh, I. Actually, there's 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 a the funny thing is that one of the the things that I was more fascinating for him for me was something that in reality uh, wasn't even true. So um, as you know, in Italian, when when you you have to take a call, I mean like when you have to work in the hospital overnight, in the Italian way you say it, you say it, you do the night, you know, far la not, you do the night. So I really thought that my father was actually making the night happen. I mean, like he was going to a place and then the night would happen. And for me, it was really fascinating. When I was a kid, it's like my dad does the night for everybody. I don't know if you guys understand. So I said, I want to do that in my life. And of course, I realized that it wasn't really true. But um, um, still, his job was fascinating for me. So I, I always thought I was going to be a cardiologist. I... Um, I graduated and then um, I, I had a strong passion for, uh, I mean, well, the United States always fa fascinated me and, uh, and also um, research, meaning I wanted to, to make a difference in terms of, uh, um, you know, discover something uh, or um, becoming, I mean, being in the front line of, you know, new discoveries and everything. So I got very interested in, in uh, stem cell research, which is a very cutting edge, I mean, uh, future, futuristic uh, type of, of, um, of research. And, uh, and um, in, in a very, um, uh, I would say, um, I mean, without, without any fear, I would say we, we, me and my wife and a little kid, Matteo, that was uh, 10 months old, we left Italy where, um, and, and we went to New York uh, where we found a place where we could do research, me and my wife together. And uh, we didn't know anyone there. And um, we didn't know anyone in New York. I mean, we did know someone, but they were really far away. New York is a very large, um, I mean, has a very large metropolitan, metropolitan area. And so I was, we were about two hours, I mean, at least an hour and a half away from any, anyone else. Uh, and uh, when we got there, um, we, we went into this um, lab that was um, very, very, and, and it was a very tough time for me because uh, this is a place where they have 25 NIH, so basically federally funded grants. So 
the the attention for details is unbelievable the um, the pace in which they work it's it's uh i mean it's, uh, it's something that you can't even imagine unless you work there to give an example i mean i they we start and first meeting that i had with my boss is like okay we have to we're going to try to do this uh type of um of uh experiment and everything and and so we need some reagent or something and this was a meeting at five o'clock in the afternoon in the morning after eight o'clock i come to work and he's like okay let's start the experiment he tells me and i'm like well i mean the reagent we need to order them he's like what do you mean we need to order them you don't have them yet i was like no and he's like well we had a meeting at five o'clock yesterday you had to go back to your office order them have an overnight shipping and this morning at eight o'clock we start the experiment like oh uh, yeah so. I mean, I used to be with in the the pace that we used to have in my my hospital in Italy, where it's like we have a meeting, we decide we want to do something, and then two three days to figure out how we're gonna get it done. And so, and the guy says, "Listen, here it doesn't work this way. Either you get things done, or or I'm gonna have somebody else do it for you, and you go back home." So that was one thing. And one week after we started, I'm working in my office, my computer, and there is a guy by my side, and they come in and they say. Okay, you're fired uh, to the other guy, not to me, but the other guy. And, and he just came with me. I'm like, what happened? So basically overnight, he sent the picture to someone who was not supposed to send it. So all this to say that it was a fairly intense place. And it was just uh, me and my wife and a little kid, which we, we had to put in the daycare for all day. Um, but, but again, but, but we did it because... Um, I was following a, a dream. I was following a, a strong, strong passion that we had. Um, truth to be told, uh, this experience turned out to be quite a failure. Uh, so um, the uh, two years, almost two years of research, I couldn't come up with anything really good because uh, well, the story really is that uh, I was telling the boss, my boss, that uh, I didn't, I wasn't getting the results, and that uh, I think there was something wrong with the research, and 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 that's how basically I got pushed back, and because in these places, I mean, if you don't get the results that they're expecting, somebody else will get them for you. So I, I'm slowly, I was slowly pushed back. Now, ten years later, I. I I I got my revenge because the guy now is in jail because they find out that uh, it was all these data were fraud. So, but uh, but the reality was that uh, um, I was hoping. That, so when you get to the United States, your boss is very important because then he's going to open new doors and everything. So with the fact that I was pushed back in my job, all doors got closed. So we, we basically, uh, two years, we were for two years in the United States, and we had no uh, future in terms of job opportunities. So we were start thinking of going back, going back to Italy. Um, and uh, and uh, at that point, though, I, I did something silly. So I applied for, for the green card. So in, in the United States to work, you need a green card, which is like a, which is basically the first step before you become a citizen. And uh, United States has, the country has of, of opportunities and everything. They also have, I mean, green card is not given to everyone. There, there are some specific criteria which you can get a green card that are based on your work. And, uh, and so on that side, I would never gonna be able to get a green card because I didn't have a job basically. Uh, so I applied for a lottery. There is a lottery. It's almost like a lottery. You apply for a lottery and uh, and they pick like 50,000 people a year and they just give them the green card. And then they say, okay, you have a green card, now find yourself a job. I didn't have a, jo I have a job or anything, but I just said, you know what, let me apply for the green card. And also I had my wife apply for the green card. I didn't even tell her actually that I applied for her. And so in the midst of this uh, thinking of going back to Italy and everything, I get the answer that she wants the green card. And, um, and, and, and so I said, well, that's, uh, that's a, that, that's that's a crack, as 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 we were saying. So uh, let let me just uh, figure out what I really want. So I said, you know what? I really like to be a doctor. This research thing uh, is not working for me. I I love to talk to patients. I love to stay with people. 
I love to be in the midst of, 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 the, of the action, if you want to say. So I said, I, why don't I try to go back and become a doctor in the United States? So in, to become a doctor in the United States, uh, first you need a green card, but that we got. But uh, you have to have, you have to know someone that introduces you to large institution and everything. You know, a lot of people come here to the United States and they go and work in places like Mass General, um, um, Mayo Clinic, you know, um, New York Presbyterian, those big institutions. I didn't know anyone there. So I had to start from the bottom. So I just applied myself for, for oh no, wait, before that. So I, you have to take three tests, which basically are three tests that they, they, they're three exams, like written exam, multiple choice, that they cover pretty much six years of med school. So all the studies of med school, starting from chemistry, biology that you do in the first year to, you know, uh, internal medicine and pathology in the last year. So in six months, I had to take these three big tests. And you imagine I already finished my, my med school two years before I did this. So three years before I did this. So going back to school was just a, was a, a, really, a really big deal. So I said, OK, uh, I'll try. And so I took a test. I studied and I took a test. And of course, I failed. So, um, so I said, OK, so that means uh, we got to go back, uh, back home. Um, but I said no. Um, so I, I remember having this dinner at some friend's house. Um, this a friend of mine that uh, Marta knows very well, Jonathan, that, uh, that um, lives in New York. Is, uh, does nothing, has nothing to do with my job and everything. He's like an artist, musician and everything. And but we're having dinner and I said, I failed. I should go back to to. Um, we have to go back to Italy, and he says, "But what? What do you? What's your? What's your passion? What do you like? What do you want to do?" And I said, "I really want to be a doctor in the United States." So I said, "So that's so New York is like this. New York, if you fail, you you go. They, they New York puts you down. You stand up and you start all over." I said, "Okay." So um, based on this, I said I shouldn't give up. So I I I started to study again, and here a little difference. I mean, I. I Try to be reasonable. I found a different way to study. To I studied, um, I get to know the, the the test better and everything. And I took the test and um, and then I passed. And then I took the other one a month later and I passed. I took the other one a month later and I passed. And so, but then now I have to apply for residency and I don't know anyone. Residency is because although I did six years of internal medicine, four years of cardiology in Italy, if you come to the United States, you have to start from scratch. So you have to do three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology, and then if you want to be an interventional cardiologist like I am, another year. So it's seven year training that I committed to start. I didn't even know anyone to start. It. So I applied and I got only two interviews and I got one interview in Staten Island, which was this, uh, this hospital that it was uh, kind of falling apart, uh, bankrupt. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, um, my, my test scoring wasn't that good and everything, but I got to, that there was this program director who really had said, oh, did my interview, and he's like, oh, you barely speak English, but you have, you see a lot of passion in, in you, and see a lot of passion. So she took me. And so then again, in 2007, we moved again to United States. I mean, we, we left for a few months and then we came back again with the idea of staying. And, and from then on, then three years of internal medicine, I became a chief resident, which is um, basically when you're a resident in training, basically like a specializzando in Italy, but a little more, uh, more on the working side. But anyway, uh, they nominate one that it's like also is going to be in charge of organizing the other one. So and it has to have. And, 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 and I got that, um, that position. <inaudible> So, um, so um, at this point, uh, and then I, um, I met for a fellowship. So then I did a fellowship three years and then an interventional fellowship. And then uh, again, started to find, to, to find work. And when I had to start my job, I started my own practice because I said, I'm never going to work for a hospital. Um, and, and so I, I started my own practice. It's very difficult. I mean, being a private cardiologist, a lot of business problems, everything. 
And so again, I was uh, in the verge of a new failure because it's like, this is not working. I probably have to move somewhere else or anything. And the hospital said, well, I think you're good. You should become the chief of cardiology. So, okay. So again, in the midst of, uh, of, um, of difficult times, again, a new opportunity came up. And um, I mean, this is the whole story. I mean, in a summary, the whole story, but the reality is what I, I, I want to, want you guys to understand in that that really care uh, and then they really uh, it's uh, in a nutshell the, the value of, of my experience is that um, yeah I mean there is that the, you, you you never give up that's true I mean that's 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 true but also I mean it, it's easy to say never give up when when uh, when things go well but um, uh, you I, I wouldn't. I, I I I didn't give up even when things were not going well, you know. And and the reason is is that uh, I always had the sense that there was uh, there was there was some something behind the things that I that that were immediately happening to me that were guiding me somewhere. Truth to be told, most of the decisions that I made in my in my in my life. Even if uh, I had to have decision made, I mean, you know, when, when you make a decision, you think you could have like 10 different opportunities and everything. But in some way or another, all these opportunities, they kept that just going down and left me with one opportunity, one, one thing. So it's almost like the life is guiding me as long as you, you, you keep your eyes open, as long as you don't, don't give up on your, on, on your, on your passion. So um, I don't know if that is clear and... Uh, but that's that's a little bit about my life, and then maybe maybe we can I can answer some question if you guys want. Because otherwise, I think it's boring. Okay. So uh, is is this point uh, clear for everyone? Uh, may I see you your face because uh, I just uh, have the vision of few people among you. It's, it's better also for the speaker to to have uh, in front people. Okay, beautiful. So, do do you have any question about uh, what uh, uh, Doctor Rotatori said? Just said. Ah, uh, I, I finally uh, see also Eliana Marinoni, who's uh, our wonderful teacher of philosophy and Michelle Curran, uh, who is our uh, super duper uh, mother tongue uh, English teacher. I apologize for my, for my English. Uh, <laughs> of course, it's uh, born, I mean, it's learned in, in New York where all the accents are very well accepted. Definitely not a British accent, accent, but I have to say that people like my accent over here. Yeah, I, I tell you, you spoke very well. You use, use a lot of nice expressions. I like the expressions you use. They're really nice. Like okay. in a nutshell, all these kind of expressions. They're great. So yeah. well done. Okay. Thank okay. You, thank you. okay. Well, one thing that is funny to know is that, you know, true, when I started my residency, my first month in, in ICU, uh, so first of all, the lab where I worked was, was uh, run by an Italian guy and they were all Italian fellows. But we were we were uh, forced to speak English, but basically nobody knew really English very well, so it came out like a very confusing situation. So when I finally started to work in the hospital where everybody was like American, uh, the first month of my my orientation, the report that I got is that that my attending wrote, "I am not sure you understand what what we're saying all day long." I'm like, I don't. In fact, it was true. I had no clue what they were saying. But then eventually, I. Yeah, okay, so I know there, there are uh, some of you uh, who are thinking uh, about become, uh, about uh, starting a career as a doctor. Is that true or not? Have I to call you by name? Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, so Ginevra, Anna. Yeah. Uh, Ginevra, Anna. No, no, not me. You never said no. Okay. Yes, I do. Anna, yes, sure. Where are you? There are two questions. Thank you. 
Okay. One from Gabriel people. and one from Anna Volonté. So please. Oh, okay, Gabriel. beautiful. You don't have to, sorry, you don't have to write me the question. Okay. You have to tell me to ask me. Then, then when you okay. speak, you, uh, you switch on your video so we can see you. Okay. Video and uh, remember to unmute you. Uh, audio, okay. audio. Where are you, Anna? Gabriel and Anna. Anna, Gabriel, Gabriel. qui davanti a Gabriel, forza. Try, Gabriel. Yes, Gabriel. If you are shy, if you are uh, shy, don't worry. Um, here's Gabriel. I understand very well the the fraud that you had to face um, in your life uh, when you. Uh, when you went to America. Can you repeat it, please? What? I didn't understand your question. Um, Parla in italiano, che se no non, non si capisce. Cosa hai chiesto? Da quanto ho capito, lui ha dovuto affrontare un, um, un capo estremamente severo e cioè non una brava persona per nulla. Non ho ben capito quel fatto. Ok. Yes. yes, yes. So, yeah, uh, so I mean, of course, no. Um, so, um, so the, the, the premise is this. The way research works is that um, when you're doing research, you have to, to be funded. You need to find money to do the research, okay? So what you do, you, 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 you make a project, then you apply to different institutions. You can go to a private institution, you can go to Johnson & Johnson and say, hey, I have this idea, can you give me a million dollars to do this research? And, uh, and, uh, and they give it to you. That's private. But if you want to do like um, some, some, I mean, like the real research, the one that has, is unbiased, and, and so you apply for NIH grant. Uh, NIH is the National Institute of Health, um, and uh, it's the one that is a big. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a institute that gets money from from taxes basically, from and and distribute them to to researchers based on uh, on the project. So you present the project. It has to be appealing. It has to be good. Then you ask for the money. You get the money. So. The place where I worked was was um, strongly funded by NIH grant, so there was millions and billions of dollars that were involved in the research, and of course, when when that is the case, you end up in a place in which there's a lot of um, rivalry between people. There's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of um, information that has to be needs to be kept very. Um, they have to be kept secret, they have to be, um, um, and, and on top of that, there is a pace in doing the work that is crazy because if you are the first one getting to some research, you're good. If you're the second one, you're nobody because once somebody else got to the same problem, you, you, you're done. I mean, is that, they say, oh, I found it too. It's like, who cares? He found it first. So. The, the 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 pace and was really really uh, intense, and also uh, the problem is that in this situation, I don't know if you guys have seen. I don't know if you guys have on Netflix. There's there was an interesting documentary on on something similar to what happened to me. It was this uh, company that decided that they were able to do all blood tests on one drop of blood. And um, I don't know if you if you know about this, but this basically this woman, very with, with great ideas and everything, came up with the idea that blood tests instead of having to draw blood was going to be done just with a drop of blood. And uh, the the reality is that that uh, that project actually never had any. Uh, there was nothing through in that project, but she made it to get funded by Walgreens for millions and millions of dollars. Obama went to went to see her. He said, "This is the future and everything," but she had zero evidence of of, of what was going on, and and that became a big fraud and everything. Same thing happened to my mm, the lab where I was working. 
the pressure on getting results on these poor fellows like us, you know, say, I come from, from Italy, I go there, and it's like, okay, we're going to do this experiment, and we're expecting to find this, this, and this. You go and you do your work, and you're like, I have to get this done. I have to get the results he's asking me, you know? So it's a psychological work on, and, and, so, and uh, so we are like 24 fellows competing in getting the results that he was asking for. So if I would go to him and say, yeah, I tried the experiment, it's not working. He was saying, oh, okay, so let me ask him to do it. And then he does it and he gets it done, in which way we don't know, but he gets the result. And then he gets the name in the paper. I don't get the name in the paper because, oh, you didn't get it. Okay, next time we'll ask you something else. And slowly I'm the one always saying, hey, this doesn't work. Hey, this doesn't work. Hey, this doesn't work. Slowly I get pushed back and I get thrown out. So that's what happened to me. Okay. Did you understand, Gabriel? Yeah. So, but this is the, um, the hospital where you were uh, like uh, 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 doing surgery on the pigs. I remember you had to deal with pigs. A with... bunch of animals, a bunch of any different animals, yeah. It, it was from, that one. From, huh? from mice to pigs. Yeah. Okay. Anna. Yes, I had a question. I, I wanted to ask you how did your job change due to COVID emergency? Yes, good question. So, um, so the job changed completely. Um, first of all, I don't know if you if you know if you know this but because it went in the, i mean it wasn't the newspapers or anything but for some reason during covid heart disease kind of disappeared like heart attack the the number of heart attack dropped tremendously stroke dropped tremendously who knows why not clear most likely it's because people had fear to go to the hospital so maybe they had heart attack anyway but just they didn't make it to the hospital but anyway so Given that, and given the fact that I work in a fairly small hospital, uh, I, uh, I, when, when the pandemia started hitting the hospital, uh, I decided to commit myself to work basically as an intensive care uh, physician, which I am not. But, I mean, I studied internal medicine, and I, I work with very sick people anyway when I work as a cardiologist. So I guess I was the first one in line to help out our intensivists. To give you an idea of the numbers, so our hospital is like a 300, um, 300 beds hospital around that. 300, yeah, about 300 beds. And has an intensive care unit that has 10 beds. Uh, and has one full-time inten intensive care physician. So um, basically, um, in Italian, the, it's called uh, anesthesista reanimatore. Um, here, anesthesiologist and intensive care are separated. So this guy does intensive care, takes care of people that are intubated, they're, you know, they're very, very sick and all that. So we have 10 beds of intensive care. At the peak of the pandemic, we had uh, 75 patients in intensive care unit. And we had 280 patients in the hospital that were for COVID. So basically the full hospital was full of COVID patients. We had, uh, and we had to come up with seven times the numbers of intensive care beds that we usually have. And we have one intensivist that works full time and one part time. So I took my two other cardiologists that work with me and said, okay, we have to do something about this. So we, so we have an area of the hospital that is for outpatient that of course was closed. And, and we make it a new intensive care unit. So we, uh, be, because, I'll tell you why, this didn't happen immediately. So what happened immediately happened this, that because we didn't have an intensive care unit, a lot of patients that need intensive care, intensive care, they were sent to regular floor. But that wouldn't work because uh, if you don't give the attention to these people, even watching them, they were so sick that if you don't give them the attention, they can potentially even die. 
So when we start to see this, so we had every morning, we had a, a briefing with a group of doctors in the hospital and we were coming up with ideas. So I said, we need a space in which we can at least look at all the patients. You know, I have to see them all. So endoscopy, which is an outpatient service, had a very large um, recovery area where the patient after they had an endoscopy or so, they just stay there for a few hours before they go home. And there's a central nursing station. So I said, okay, let's take this area and create an ICU, intensive care unit. So we brought there like 16 patients. Um, and then the problem came because uh, th there was a concern about the fact that all these patients, all with COVID in this area, we were risking, I mean, for ourselves. So we had to build some separation. So I had, uh, I spent a day with, uh, with this uh, construction worker and we came up with a way to separate with just plastic. We created plastic walls in all, all the beds to create rooms and everything. I can show you a picture of the mess that we did because it was kind of crazy. So first of all, let me see if I can show you some picture. But anyway, so that, that was the idea. Just uh, getting getting uh, the patient in an area in which we could watch them. And then, of course, I decided to, so this is how we were dressed at the beginning. So we didn't have anything more than, than this, which is a regular mask, some goggles, and, and, and uh, like a red hat that we would reuse. And then we got better. Then we got, so this is a, the area that I created. I don't know if you can see it. But you see plastic walls. And then nursing station and all that, see? Yeah. The arrows are to show where you can get in because there was this plastic wall, we didn't know how to get in. So, um, but, but it, was, it was unbelievable because you, you find yourself in a place in where uh, basically you have an entire staff that is just, uh, you, give up, you give them ideas and they just do it. You're like, we need to do this. Okay, let's do it. So then... Of course, I said 60, 70 patients need ICU. So after we b finish building all the endoscopy, we had the ICU, we start taking recovery rooms from the, we had few other patients that we need to, we need to uh, take care of an intensive care unit. So we started buying uh, baby monitors, you know, the monitors that uh, you know, parents use to check the babies if they're sleeping or not. We were using them from outside inside the room. So we were putting them in the nursing station and then having one in every room so we could watch them. But you know, like literally having a meeting and then going on Amazon and buying them and using them. It was a, it was an incredible uh, experience in which you see how, that's a little bit of a fascinating part of, of, of United States in which uh, there is this sense that if things get, needs to get done, I mean, okay, let's, you know, tell me what to do. We'll do it. I mean, and I was just coming up with ideas. I was just, why don't we do this? And we did it. Uh, of course, from, a, from an emotional standpoint, was, uh, um, was, was terrible. I mean, you, you guys uh, know, because you, you've seen this. You, and, and you maybe know someone that died or know someone that was in the hospital. One of the things, that, the biggest thing that changed to me, the change in my in my job was not also doing, not, not only doing a different job, I mean, like not a cardiologist, but something else. But, and, but even more so was the fact that the concept of being a doctor changed for me because usually we, as doctors, we are healers. We, we cure, we make feel, people feel better. In this case, a lot of people were dying anyway. So, and uh, so we were doing something different. We were a company, we were staying with the patient uh, in the moment they died. They had no family there, nobody was allowed in the hospital. And they were, um, they were in difficult times and everything. And the only people they would see were us because, and not only that, I mean, we were told not to spend too much time with the patient because we didn't have good protection, we didn't have good, so it's really, uh, and so when you go in the room of, with this patient and they have, they're going to see someone, they're, they're, they're in the last days of their life and they're going to see someone for probably five minutes in a day or 10 minutes in a day. Uh, so then, then your job is, is really something different. You just stay with someone before they die and, and uh, talking about 
you know, t- trying to give a little comfort or anything. And I have a million of experience of this that are like, that of course are going to stay in my, in my memory forever. I had, had a patient that was, um, at, there were two patients in the same room and one patient, I went to see this one patient, but behind the curtain, I hear these other patients screaming and screaming. And of course, it was a patient with dementia. So it wasn't really make any sense. He kept talking about his, uh, his cousin or uh, my cousin, my cousin and everything. So I had this idea. So I told him, I like, who's your cousin? And then he said the name and I'm like, oh, I know him. He's a good guy. And it's not true. Of course, I didn't know him. But and, and the guy got a smile on his face right away. He's like, oh, you know him? He's like, yeah, of course. So I start talking to him. And, and I don't know. I mean, he's like, his day changed. I mean, find find the connection. I just spent five minutes there. So was that being a doctor? Probably was the highest level of um, being a doctor because being a doctor is not only um, um, taking care of people and have them, you know, okay, now you're cured, you can go. And that's fun. I mean, it, 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 it is rewarding. Uh, to an, it is very rewarding. But, but sometimes the doctor is just someone that is called to be with the patient in the most difficult time of their life. And, uh, and, and, and I have patients telling me, it's like, oh, coming to you is like coming to, to, uh, go, coming to a priest. I mean, I feel welcomed. I feel like I can talk. I can tell you freely all my problems. And, and that's what we do. That's what I'm never going to be a successful doctor <laughs> because because I spend too much time with my patients, but, um, and, and I don't make enough money for the hospital, but, but, uh, but um, no, it, it, it was like in, 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 in a matter of a month, all the, the problems that we had about productivity and hey, making things work and uh, the money and everything got thrown away and said, listen, this is being a doctor, you know, and um, was a was a, an incredible experience. On top of that, it also created incredible bond with my coworkers, the one that accepted the, the challenge that that started from me. But I mean, of course, they accepted at the same level that, that to to just forget about everything else and just give everything that we had. We spent days and days in the hospital. I don't know how many days I spent in the hospital without even going back home, you know. Um, going back home, we didn't feel that good in going back home anyway, because, you know, I mean, like all the infection and everything, we didn't know much. And, 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 and also the, there are residents in the hospital. Usually in my hospital at night, there's only residents. So they're like the, the younger doctors, trainees, right? And, uh, and the attendings, at well, a certain time they go home and then if there's a problem, we come back, but and you have the sense, I mean, after two days that I go back home and I come in the morning and I see the faces of these young kids. I mean, they're like, they're 20s, they're not kids, but I mean, they're, they're young. And they, you see them, they face, you know, all these uh, sick patients overnight. And, and you're like, I can't leave them alone. So I, I just stayed. I mean, not even, well, was I doing something good? Probably nothing major. I mean, yeah, we saved a couple of patients, probably, of course. But it was mostly being with them and say, you know, you can't be alone in this moment. You know, like the same as the patient, also the doctors, they can't be alone. Yeah. This, this uh, is very important. Did you understand the, uh, the, the passage when, he, when uh, Dr. Dorotatori told uh, about uh, what does it mean to be a doctor at the high, highest level? which is not to be a successful doctor, but actually it is. Guys, did you understand? Yoo-hoo. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Silenzio di tomba. Yes. See, at one point we had to put like, I'm show you a picture. We yeah, had yeah. we put we put pictures of ourselves on 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 the gown so patient could see who they were dealing with. Wow, that, that's impressive. Because you know we we always had like you know face mask and everything. They couldn't see us, so that's a picture of me, and that's <laughs> me, and that's my medical assistant. By the way, 
my medical assistant that they there's a three medical assistant that they work for me in the office when when the, the pandemic started we closed down the office i didn't go they were here but i was coming by every once in a while to, you know to to check and stuff and everything and they saw so much passion in me that they decided to come to work in the hospital and they came to work as a medical assistant in the hospital during the pandemic yeah that was that was great anyway go ahead yeah i wanted to ask if uh, um do you consider milan university as uh, a great one since you um traveled and uh, experienced other universities um yes yes absolutely so this is me and that's my <laughs> my resident that's my resident yeah so he put his mask on 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 his head and that was my <laughs> cover sometimes we were trying to to breathe you know anyway so um um the 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 the, the, the easy answer is yes university of milan i mean you study milano is very good the the, the The biggest answer is this. So, um, depending on where you want to work, of course, um, there, there might be some problems. For instance, United States is very committed to people that graduated from their university. So, when you come from somewhere else, you're kind of like second level. So, but I mean, you can move your way up. You have to work hard and you can move your way up, but you're considered like second level. However, the, the uh, end, this is the second difference is. Um, the way they, they teach medicine here, like probably most of the other things also, is very um, uh, problem oriented. It's more like, in this case you do this, in this case you do this, in this case you do this. In fact, even the test in med school and everything, it's, it's multiple choice. It's written test, multiple choice, written test, multiple choice. These guys, they know everything is like, okay, so, Uh, patient comes with chest pain. What do you do? This, 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 this. Boom. Answer. Uh, patient comes, patient have, what is this sign? This, 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 this. They have, they're very schematic, very, very schematic, which in 80% of the time during your job is good. Uh, but there's the 20% left in, in, in which usual, in which is one patient out of five, which is pretty common, in which The reality is not as the book, okay? The patient tells you everything and the opposite. And now you have to dig in, and now you have to understand better, and now you have to have a larger vision, you have to have larger knowledge. So med school in Italy, with the oral exam, with, with the, it's, in my opinion, better than the United States. Med school is better than the United States. At one point though, Uh, when, when you go to the next level, like specialization and everything, then it's where the United States goes, boom, way up. Because they don't have fear of taking young people and throwing them out in the field and teach them stuff. Here we have the say, see one, do one, teach one, right? If you don't know how to do something, you see it once, you do it yourself one, and then you're ready to teach to someone else. Okay, if you are a surgeon in Italy, you have to wait years and years and years before they put you out there. When I started my internal medicine residency, I spent the night putting a central line with a, a resident that was actually two years younger than me, but she was a second year. So, and, and when I left Italy, the, the primario, the, like the, the, the senior attending was doing this procedure. And now I'm, I'm doing it myself. So med school and, and the way we teach with a broader, um, understanding of things and everything i think is better than anywhere else i mean i haven't seen all the world of course but and then the step the the, 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 the subsequent i mean the following step not i mean maybe somewhere else is better so my suggestion is do what i did <laughs> it takes forever though <laughs> i mean for me it was 17 years of training that's a little too much but uh, but, but because you Push, uh, you follow your, your dream. Uh, you didn't of course. Stop. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
And so uh, when you were in high school in Italy, what kind of high school uh, did you uh, went in? I, go, I went to um, Liceo Classico. Wow. So you, you did study Latin and Greek. And Greek, yes. And they, they, were they useful for, for your uh, background also as a, as a doctor? <laughs> Oh, jeez. Yeah, no, no they're going to hate me. Come on. <laughs> yes, very, they were very useful. Very useful. Very useful. I mean, uh, I mean, besides the fact that all the terms in medicine are derived from Latin and everything, which, of course, is something important, but, I mean, at the end of the day, but is the is the, the way you approach problems that you learn in Latin and Greek. Not to mention that you read some amazing stuff and everything that, I mean, uh, when you're gonna be old like me, you realize how, how amazing is what you're studying now. And right now it looks like boring, I gotta do this, I know, oh, I hate these people. Then one day you say, these people were amazing, why didn't I just enjoy it at that time? But I think it's like that for everybody. But yes, Latin and Greek are critically important for your training, even for math, um, for, for physics, for, um, especially for physics, because I think that the, the law of physics are very, very similar to the law of Latin and Greek, because everything makes sense. I always tell my, my I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that good uh, in, in high school. And you know when you're not good is because at one point things don't make sense, you know? And then you just try to figure it out and everything. But in, I remember my grandma used to be a great uh, Latinista and, and Grecista. Um, and when she was reading me, it's like I was, I was doing like a, like a version, eh, right? No, in, uh, in Latin or so. And I started doing it and she was coming by and she's like, hold on one second. Let me read it for you. And she would start reading and just the way she was reading made sense. It's like, oh, now it makes sense. <laughs> because she had this, you know, she could speak in Latin. Like, like, uh, we, we, need, uh, we need to translate this uh, for uh, Professor Poncetta. Le abbiamo chiesto se eh, studiare, lui ha fatto il liceo classico, gli abbiamo chiesto se studiare latino e greco gli è stato utile. E lui ha detto molto. Eh, soprattutto perché c'è una, una logica comune, per esempio, tra la fisica e, e le lettere classiche. E poi ha fatto l'esempio di sua nonna, che eh, era una grecista, una latinista, e quando lui stava, diciamo, sudando sulla, sulla versione, eh, cambiava completamente l'orizzonte solo dal modo con cui la leggeva. Eh? il fatto di leggerla gli svelava completamente il senso no? e questo è il segno che è, è, è uno studio che costruisce proprio la forma mentis Good. Ho una domanda Infatti mi veniva spontaneo dire a quelli di quinta e di quarta chi ha orecchie intenda <ride> Grazie, eh, grazie E <ride> question, sì Yes, I have a question. Yes. Nicolò, grande Nicolò. Hi, Nicolò. I'd like to ask, have you ever lost a patient while you were uh, doing uh, an operation on him? And uh, what feeling uh, do you have in that moment, uh, you and your equip? Yes, I did. Uh, uh, of course, it happens. Um, sometimes it happens even even if you didn't do anything wrong. It's not. It's, not, uh, it's um, I mean, it's tough. Although I have to say that uh, um, it, it, it's a, it's a. I mean, it's hard to say in this way, but it's somehow a privilege. Uh, moment um, when you realize that uh, there are certain things in life that happens that you can't do anything about it and uh, actually 
that even sometimes you might be the instrument of something that goes wrong. Um, uh, importantly, in, 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 and uh, I say it's privileged because I think that goes completely against what uh, the common reality, the common society, the common thinking right now is telling you, which is that everything that you do has a value as long as has success and has, uh, has um, um, either immediate or maybe a little long term, but mostly immediate now satisfaction, immediate uh, return. Uh, instead, sometimes you do things and that's a failure. However, uh, it, uh, it goes into deep, deeper understanding of, uh, of who we are. Because if you, if you understand that uh, a moment you're here and a moment after you're, you're not there anymore, you're, you're then, and you witness that moment, it's something that, that stays with you. I mean, the way I looked at life being a doctor and having seen a lot of people dying, it's something that I always say, unfortunately, for people that are not doctors, and it's something that you can understand. I mean... It's, it's almost like it goes down to the, to, the, to the earth. It goes down to the, to the, the deepest the human, the human understanding of, of the human body as part of, of a whole. I mean, the body is it's, it's going to go. I mean, it's not staying. And I know perfectly. I mean, I, I don't fear that. I, 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 people are dying every day, and, and, and we, we, I witness it every day. The only one thing that I want to say uh, on top of this is that, and I don't want to sound too creepy, though, but um, being a doctor is very important because you said you and your team, what you feel. So the, the fact is that we work together, but when, something, when, when someone dies and we are like team working and then we give up, and I mean, there is the moment in which the doctor calls it and say, this is the time of death. Uh, everybody looks at you. So you better be ready with not something to say, but even the way you respect the body, the way you respect the situation, you kind of, you're more in charge in that moment than any other moment. Because before when we work, everybody knows what to do. Everybody does his job and everything. There's a moment that everybody stops and basically everybody looks at you, you know, and wants to see, I mean, and, and your reaction in this situation, sometimes people coming back and tell you, you know, like I, I deeply appreciate the way you respect the situation, the way you look at the situation, not to mention when you go and talk to the families, which is you know, something that I have to do. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a very tough, but uh, yeah, it's part of our job, of course. Yeah, but it, it, pushed, uh, it pushed you to, to show your, uh, Mm, your be better better side of your humanity you know is a is a crack uh, uh, full of gold you know because okay other question allora c'è Aurora e poi la professoressa Bianchi oh, wow beautiful Aurora dove sei uh, my camera doesn't really work ah, okay. Non ti, non ti possiamo vedere? Eh, no, perché non mi va proprio la telecamera. Porca miseria, vabbè, pazienza. I know it's a very personal question, but when the time will come, how will I be able to understand that medicine is actually the right way for me? I mean, usually when I talk to people and they ask me what will I want to become when I grow up, I'll... Um, answer medicine, um, a medic, a surgeon, and they will only find the, a fighting way to tell me that it's difficult. And I have a lot of doubts, and so I am um, like to ask you how to overcome these difficulties and questions about the way to, to go on with. Well, that's a difficult question, but, and, and it's true, I mean, it's very personal. Um, uh, but uh, um, I would say a couple of things. One is that um, 
sometimes uh, sometimes you you are you find attractive the idea of being a doctor or you find attractive uh, Grey's Anatomy to say, I mean, like you look at these things like, ah, oh, that's cool. I want to do that. Right. So that, don't worry, you, 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 that is not going to stand. As, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, depending on how stubborn you are, you, you, you might even um, start the process and then you find out that it's not worth it, the difficulties, you know? It's not worth the struggle because there's a lot of struggle. So, um, so the 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 uh, you have to find out if you, your desire is is true or not. And uh, and um, and how do you do that? Is uh, I think you do, you don't have to worry much about that because the reality will 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 uh, will bring you there. Um, you know, uh, you 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 I don't know you 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 have the, to, to take the test to get into med school and some people don't and now the usual question is like oh i failed the first year should i try the second year should i try the third year but i really want to be a doctor i try fourth year oh but it's so the reality will tell you at one point which way to go or not um at least most of the time i mean sometimes you, you get uh, you get to know it late, but but again, even if you know late that that was not maybe your 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 goal, then you find something else. So uh, I would not worry too much. If you have something, if you have something that you believe it's your it's a passion, just try to uh, just try to uh, uh, keep it alive. I mean, just try to verify it. Just try to you know get to the bottom of it. I mean, you know. Don't just uh, keep it as an idea. Just try to see that. I don't know. Here in the United States, there's I have a lot of uh, high school students that they come to the hospital just to um, do little things. I mean, they they I mean, charts needs to be brought from one place to another. Uh, patient needs to be transported and everything. And just it's that just do that in the summertime and everything as a volunteer. Um, but. I mean, you, you get to see what happens in the hospital. You get to see if it is something that and some people do say after a while. It's like, you know what? I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like it. Or, or for instance, I, I always tell my friends, uh, in, in being a doctor, there's a lot of excitement in, in that 10% of the time and everything, but there's a lot of routine too. And I said, you rather like, you have to find the, you have to find out that if you love the routine, not the very exceptional things, because the very exceptional things, they happen every once in a while. But if you hate the routine, you're not gonna wait for the exceptional things and you're gonna be out of there. Uh, the routine is, uh, for me, a routine is like, now when I finish here this afternoon, I'm gonna see about 30 patients, right? And 20 of them, they have absolutely nothing. <laughs> they just come to see because, oh, I have pain, I have pain. And as soon as they walk in, I know they don't have anything. But I like to talk to them, you know, I, I like to have a conversation. I like to see what they, what they have to say. And so the, being a doctor, but it depends, of course, if you want to be an anesthesiologist, they're all sleeping when you see them, so it's good. But being a doctor like I am, most of it is interaction, a continuous interaction with people. You, you talk to people all day long or continuously. All the, and people, they, they come from, and, and for me, it's one of the most exciting parts of my job is that people are coming from any possible background. Being in New York here, like they say, the melting pot, I mean, everything, everything. But that's a passion that maybe is not what started my, you know, I didn't know that this was going to be. That's things to learn afterwards. So at the beginning, what can you do? If you have something that looks interesting, just go for it. And then the reality is going to tell you if it is not. Don't be too worried. Don't be too worried. And especially, don't be too worried of making mistakes. I, I failed so many times. I, the only way to succeed is to fail. No, it's true. I mean, you, ha you have to. I wish I could just be right all the time, like my son. He's <laughs> he gets everything right always. But I mean, one day it's going to happen for him too. But no, it's, uh, it's the way it is. Maria. Yes, so here I am, just a second. Okay. 
So, um, Spanish teacher. Spanish teacher, yes. Um, uh, you can speak Spanish. <laughs> if you want, much better no. than English. <laughs> so, I can't speak Spanish. okay, I, I like her to... But I don't uh, see you though. You can see me? No, I can, oh, here, here, there you are, I found it. Okay, okay good. perfect. So, um, since we both uh, handle with the people, actually, our job is uh, to uh, take care of people. Uh, for us uh, is uh, take care of uh, young people growing up and uh, you are taking care of uh, people who have some kind of uh, um, weaknesses, so uh, illnesses, etc. Um, we have to give hope to, we would like to give hope to our students you know, because actually their future is uh, in front of them. And uh, on the other side, uh, uh, we have uh, to be realistic as well. So uh, I'd like to, um, to ask you, in which way you handle when uh, uh, you have someone in front of you that is uh, really desperate, that has a lot of problems, which is uh, actually the, the worst part of uh, our mutual job. So which are the ways you can find to go on and give them hope? And in your, in your, uh, in your profession, your job is actually something uh, I think uh, daily in our profession is something different, but uh, how you can handle with the problems uh, of people you can, you can face in the daily routine, I say. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a tough one. So, um, the, uh, no, it, it's a very good question. So, the what what I would say though is that uh, it's it's very difficult, but at the same time, it's very simple. Because if you look, if you think for a second, the same problem that you, you your student is student is facing or my patient is facing facing to an extent is the problem that I have. I have myself too. I mean, if I look at myself, I find myself in so many things that I wanted to be different. Maybe I'm very, I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm constantly, uh, I'm constantly upset with myself. And I should have done this. I should have done that. There's a lot of things that, and, and I, I'm never happy completely. I'm never completely satisfied. So I understand that people are uh, in, in different situations and, 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 and worse situation than than I am, but at the end of the day, I think the the only way to 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 uh, to uh, be in contact with these people that they have some limitation is to understand that you have a limitation too, and so you should first of all not be afraid of sharing the fact that you think that there is a limitation. Now I know that, uh, I, I mean, I'm not a specialist in dealing with, with kids, of course, or, 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 or youngsters, but uh, I think that uh, the best way to, uh, to, to, to face a problem is to acknowledge the problem. So I see nowadays it's very difficult sometimes to even acknowledge the problem because of, uh, of a lot of reason, because of I mean, how the society is... Uh, is, is uh, it's going, but but uh, I, I think uh, with my patients, the way I do it is, is this. I, mean, I, I sit down with them and I say, I, I, I tell them, I think there is a big problem and uh, I'm not going to leave you alone. I, I'm going to be right with you here in, uh, in, uh, in this. And I, I'm very serious. I'm like, I tell them, I mean, like, no worries. I'm not giving up on you. And I'll, and, uh, but that's, but. I, I think that uh, the, I mean, I think that the most important thing is to be to be true because if people do see you, if you're not true, if you're not bringing anything, they'll see it and they'll they'll walk away. You 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 bring everything that you have in on the table and say, listen, uh, this 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 problem is something that I faced before with other people. I I can deal with this. I know what I'm doing. Just stay with me on this. But the problem has to be a knowledge. I don't know if you agree on that. Yes, of course. Yes. 
I think that the reality is the, the best way to start, uh, say, uh, and then you can build up uh, also mm -hmm. relationship, you know, with the, uh, as your, in your case, uh, with your patients and for us, with our, with our students. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Abbiamo altre domande? Sì, da GL, che non so chi sia. GL. Uh, sono io, prof, Giovanni. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my computer um, hasn't Quale got Giovanni? the testing camera. Quale Giovanni? Daniele. Libeccio, Giovanni ah, Libeccio. Okay. Uh, ma solo uno scientifico finora. Only the scientific lyceum had, had the questions. This is very disappointing for the other one. Eh? Okay, dai, vai Giovanni. Uh, so, good afternoon or good morning, I'm not sure about the time there. Uh, and now anyway. it's afternoon, yes. Okay. Good. Um, I'm Giovanni, and I wanted to ask two questions. So the first one is, how did you, uh, you know, actually uh, manage to get through this pandemic and cope with that also um, psychologically? Well, the second question is, as, as you said, these are, um, you know, strange and tough times for doctors and healthcare workers all around the world. Uh, don't you regret to, you know, have this kind of job? So being a doctor, it, it is quite an ordeal, isn't it? Um, thanks. Okay, the second question is, do I regret to be a doctor? Yes, yes, of course, a lot of times. But no, I mean, uh, we complain a lot. I mean, everybody complains. I mean, it's tough to be a doctor, but I mean, to me, it's still the best, the best job that I could do. And for all the reasons that I said so far, I mean, um, it's true. I mean, we should get paid more. We should uh, get more vacation. We should get, there's a lot of things that are not good in my job. I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a private life. I don't do the sports that I want to do. My friends are all in, uh, in business and they make three times the money that I make and they have three times the time that I, that I have to do other things. But this is my job. I mean, that's what I was meant to, to do. I'm clearly, I mean, I, I'm clearly not good in finance. <laughs> I spend all my money. But um, so that, no, I mean, in that sense, it's like, it, it is a tough time and, and we, sh we, sh uh, we should also always strive to get better situation, but, but I mean, I can't, I can't complain, really, I can't. Um, in terms of uh, the pandemic, I mean, psychologically, I mean, uh, uh, besides everything that I said so far, uh, I, I think, um, um, the, the, the most important, the, the most, uh, the, the things that is dearest to me in this, uh, in this situation is, uh, uh, it's again, the human interaction. I mean, the fact that uh, you can't deal with this problem being alone because, uh, uh, because uh, it, it is always like this. Every time you, every time you, uh, you uh, face a problem, um, the, the the fact that you have someone that is with you, it makes a tremendous difference. And uh, and uh, and sometimes the people that are with you are, believe it or not, or maybe someone that you that you were not expecting to be. Um, so, for instance, uh, during the pandemic, for me, uh, you know, I I look at people that generally look at me, and I I, I looked at them. And they were my biggest help, you know. As I was saying before, I mean, like this, uh, those uh, medical assistants that are uh, young, they're like in their in their twenties, and but seeing how they reacted to my initial uh, my initial response uh, for me was an inspiration. I couldn't give up on 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 that, even psychologically. I mean, even like my, my you know, coming to work and see them there at seven o'clock without getting paid extra, without getting, but just showing up in the midst of the pandemic. We didn't even know if we had good protection. We were all thought we were gonna get COVID. And they're like, no, we see you excited. I'll come with you. For you, it's like your, your heart explodes of, of, 
I mean, it, it's an explosion of, 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 of joy or at least of, of fulfillment, you know? So uh, I think having someone to share your, your, uh, your life, it's critical in, in this situation, in all tough situations, of course. Thank you. Of course. And then you are a runner also. It's not true that you don't have uh, any time for yourself. You are a big, uh, a strong runner. Yeah, but I want more time. Abbiamo altre domande? Posso? Eh, sì, sì, una da Rosalinda. Rosalinda, dove sei? Uh, hi, I think I turned my laptop on because uh, the camera doesn't work. By the way, by the way, I don't believe um, any of this, okay. <laughs> no, it's true. All of you guys that are not showing up, you just don't want to show your face, which is fine, which is fine, but I don't believe it. Go ahead. So I wanted to ask that uh, you're a doctor and you said that you always in contact with people, you always talk with them. Um, I like science and all of the stuff uh, about anatomy, etc. I really don't understand how you can um, deal with the fact that, that you're always in contact with people and you stay all the time in the same environment. How you deal with that and how can you um, organize the time between your life and your work. Meaning you're saying you don't want to stay in the same place all the time? Yes, because I think it's difficult to stay a lot of hours in the same place with the same uh, per people and doing stressful things, like people can die in your hands or in front of you. Well, I mean, of course. So first of all, yeah, I mean, it, it's partially what you say, it's true. I mean, not the same people because people here are coming and going all the time. But, uh, um, but staying in the same place is something that, yeah, I mean, uh, it's something that it's a little, uh, uh, it's one of the, 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 say, the part of my job that I would rather have it different. But the problem is that being in a physical place uh, uh, for, for a doctor is quite necessary. So there's nothing else I can do. But, but the fact that you, you, you notice this problem, it might, a lot of other people might not have noticed, might say something of, of what your, your, your desire is in terms of what you want to do in your life. Maybe, I mean, maybe you have a desire of being, of being around, which, which is not, hey, listen, you can even be a doctor and be around. There's uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders, there's people going all over the world there's a lot of, of opportunities even for doctors if they commit their life to, to be a traveler, to be a, uh, here in the United States, there's a, there's a big, I mean, there's a number of doctors that uh, they, 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 they do this job, it's called locum, locum tenens. I was actually interested in getting this position. There's, there's a company that's called uh, um, CardioSource that, uh, um, no, Scientific Solutions, sorry which uh, basically what they do is like you work for six months in a year, only six months. And in this six months, they bring you around the country in every place when there's a need for a doctor. Okay. So they pay your travel, they pay your, um, and they pay for you, your stay there. They pay for your malpractice, everything and whatever. You don't need to know this, but you're all over the place. You don't even know where you're going to be tomorrow. I mean, like you know, you go two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, three weeks, right? I don't like it. I mean, I, I, I just can't do it. I mean, maybe you have a family, you have people, I mean, I have four kids. I mean, I can't really go all, all around. But I don't, I mean, it's, it's fascinating too. So, I mean, for me, it's not a big problem I'm being in the same place. With different people all the time. Not to mention that also I have three different offices, the hospital. But quite, and then I have students, I have I have fellows, I have residents, I have students, I have patients, I have staff, I mean, I... Yeah, but also you told that dealing with the routine is the first sign to understand if your dream is real or not. Yeah. Huh? So every, every job has a, a routine and uh, you have to deal with uh, the same people for, for uh, quite time, so... 
Ok. Abbiamo... Sì, Gabriel ha un'altra domanda. Gabriel. Um, how was it been for you going to USA and change, either not in your medical life? Oh, uh, well, it's, it's a big change. Although that's, uh, that's one thing that you, you, you have to have a passion for it. I mean, like, um, there's so many things that if you leave, I mean, first of all, it's just a little disclosure here. I would suggest everyone to do an experience abroad because you, you guys don't realize um, a lot of things that we do in our daily life and daily routine that in other country, in other countries like in the United States, people don't do, or they do something completely different. So it sounds like um, it's, 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 it's something like funny, but I mean, certain things that we give for granted, they're different somewhere else, and they're done in a different way. And I'm not talking about only about food, of course, uh, but but I'm talking about like way of doing things, way of getting together. But also like, you know, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're young and everything like sports. I mean, sports that you're going to follow, sports that you're going to like. I mean, okay. I mean, the Champions League, if you like soccer, the Champions League here in the United States happens at three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. I'm seeing patients at three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. I don't watch the Champions League. It's a big change for me. I mean, I was like crazy for soccer. And then now, I mean, I still, I still am. But I, I have to follow at three, 3 in the afternoon, which is quite crazy. So I, I can't watch the games and everything. You watch other sports. You get to know baseball, football, um, and which is exciting. It's exciting to know new things. It's exciting to experience new things. So it's a big, big change, but especially the first few years, there's an excitement uh, on, uh, on seeing new things and, and everything. So it was not a problem. But it's a, it's a big shock. It's a big cultural shock, as they say, you know, when you, but, but, but I mean, that's the other thing. So you, you, seeing different cultures, it opens your mind also a lot in terms of uh, what you value, what, what it's dear to you, what it's important in your life. Um, you know, and religion is one aspect, but, but also, connected to that is also like human behavior like how people behave interact it's not granted for for us you know for you it's normal calling a friend and say hey what are you doing tonight let's just go out and for instance in the united states especially in new york i mean it's gotta organize it ask a week before because it's not the same thing it's it's different um and so you get to know this and he's like ah i don't like this uh, I, I never realized how good it is having friends that you can just call and meet up, you know, um, or, or other little things that you give for granted and they're different here. Yeah. Okay. Abbiamo qualcun altro che vuole... Eh? Elias. Elias, bellissimo. La, il liceo, il liceo scientifico sta oh, stracciando yeah. gli altri due indirizzi. Oh, here is it, yes. Completamente. Okay. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think of the American health system, which is very different from the Italian one? And uh, from my point of view, or let's say from my experience, um, I see it is as a, um, um, a bad system, uh, but I want uh, to know to know it uh, from you that you work in it. So maybe you can give me uh, examples, or uh, you can just tell me more about uh, the health system, because maybe it's not uh, how I know it, and uh, I have a bad opinion just on what I what I heard on the news. Or, or something. So, so what what you know about the system, medical system in the United States is just based on what you read, what you, yeah, or you had experience of that too? 
No, I don't. But it's uh, it's just a, a, um, because I I heard a lot of news and when I when uh, when I stayed uh, a couple of weeks in the United States, I heard a lot of uh, people uh, there that told me about their health system and they were they were very surprised uh, when I told about our health system and um, and I was very surprised because I thought that you know um, so democratic and uh, uh, I don't know wealthy um, country uh, the healthy system was uh, so poor and um, uh, it wasn't uh, for everybody but just for the rich ones and uh, I thought that it was just like only the rich ones can win and only the rich ones can uh, you know have um, the um, medical assistance and oh, I don't yeah. find it yeah. fair it's yeah no I agree uh, so of course this is a very difficult question um, that will take another two and a half hours to get an answer if you want to. But no because because the reality is that um, uh, the way the 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 medical system is the American system health system is is seen by news and media most most of the time is quite inaccurate however uh, I would, there's one, one big difference that uh, you guys have to understand in the American system and the, and, and the Italian system. So first of all, if you, in the United States, if you don't have money, if you're very poor, you do have medical care. You have Medicaid and you have Medicare, which were founded, and Medicaid was founded I think, in the 60s, Medicare later. They were funded, they're federally funded, and to cover for people either very poor or over 65, which meaning that they don't have a job anymore. Reason being is that most of the time in the, in the American system, your health insurance is linked to your job. Uh, the concept behind, the very, the, the, at the very core of the health system in the United States and, and in Italy, there's a big difference. The, American, the Italian system is called mutual the system. What it means is that we're going to take off money from your taxes, from everybody, and those money are going to be used for medical care, and this money is going to be redistributed based on necessity around. When the monies are over, so that's the good part. The bad part is that when the monies are over, are over for everybody. If we finish the money for this month, nobody gets the medical care. Now, have you ever seen a, a region finish money? You don't. But I can tell you that, for instance, uh, if you go to uh, my region, Mark, in summer, and you look for uh, for an ENT doctor, so ENT is an ear, nose, and throat doctor, Otorino Lingoyatra, and you want to see in summer, August 10, there's one in the whole region of Mark. And why is that? because they can't afford to have another one, okay? Why is that? It's because that's the system. The system is mutual. Everybody puts the money in, there's a budget, budget is done. We can pay for one ENT dot. You can be millionaire, you can be poor. You wanna see an ENT, there's one. That's the, the mutual system. So the advantage is that everybody's on the same level, the medical care is on the same level, but, but, uh, the budget is what, what drives, and, and what happens though, is that if you, if you bring to that to the extreme, it's like, you know what though, there is another ENT doctor, but it's private. So if you have money, you can go to the private doctor, even in Italy. And I'm not talking about ENT simply, I mean, I'll give you another example. Uh, prevention, breast exam, or, or breast um, uh, mam mam mammogram which is something that all the women do, do after a certain age. So in Pesaro, where, where I'm from, I mean, where my wife is from, in Pesaro, you want to do a breast exam, um, there is a list of, there was a waiting list of three years. You're supposed to do it every year. So you don't get it. So what do you do? Routinely, they go all private. 
So everybody pays for the amount Why? Because the budget is not, there's not enough money. That's the neutral system. The American system is then, is based, the core of the American system is based to a different, in a different level. The American system says, you don't want the insurance, you don't get the insurance. You don't want to pay for insurance, you don't get pay for insurance. If you want insurance, you make a personal contract with an insurance company, which means the insurance company says, okay, you are such an agent, 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 I'll give you insurance for this money. You pay, whatever happens to you, then we pay for you. Okay, so if I am in, in whatever, in New York and I need an ENT doctor and I have medical insurance, I don't wanna hear that there's no ENT doctor. And I don't wanna hear that there's a private doctor because I have insurance, I'll get it. However, I have to pay for this uh, on a monthly basis. But if I decide not to pay, I can say, you know what, I wanna take my chance. That's a freedom in the United States. You wanna take your chance? Don't take, don't get insurance. Now, Obamacare tried to change that by forcing everybody to have insurance. If you, if you want, if you, it said everyone has to have insurance. So they tried to move towards a more neutral system, but it's something in between that is not working because it's not the mutual system because still people don't get, all, some people don't get insurance and there's not enough money to cover, to cover a mutual system. So it's a hybrid situation that really is not working. So do I, like, do I like one system better than the other? At the very core, yes, I do like the Italian system better than the American system, because I do think that given that healthcare should be, uh, uh, should be given to everyone, I think that we should start from the point that everyone should get insurance. However, I understand that it's not working that too. So what's the solution? It's probably it's a very, very complicated hybrid system between the two or, or a system in which a certain amount of, of um, likely or, or necessary coverage is, is, is guaranteed to everybody. And then if you can pay for something extra, you get something extra. If you can't pay, you can't pay. But that's more similar to what the American system is. So I don't know, I don't really have a final answer, but it's complicated though. Bene. Eh, ci sono altre domande? No. Allora, eh, beh, eh, ringraziamo tantissimo il professor Rotatori per tutte le cose che ci ha detto questa sera, eh, partendo dalla sua esperienza. Eh, cerchiamo di farne tesoro perché eh, alcune sue affermazioni sono, eh, sono di grande peso no? per, per la nostra, anche per la nostra vita. E, niente, se ci fossero ancora delle domande sapete che avete sempre la possibilità di, di esprimerle e poi eventualmente le mandiamo al professor Rotatori che troverà il, um, qualche minuto per rispondere. Eh, grazie, a <ride> grazie a tutti, e ci vediamo domani a scuola con quelli che sono di turno, perché noi abbiamo i turni. Eh, chi, chi Io non tocca? sono di turno. Domani a chi tocca? Lo scientifico. Ah, grande! Lo scientifico stasera ha spopolato, eh? Se abbiamo, abbiamo avuto solo domande da, dai ragazzi dello scientifico. Eh, grazie a voi, è stato un piacere. Francesco, grazie mille. E a presto. Saluti a tutti quanti, eh, mi raccomando. Certo. Grazie davvero, arrivederci. Ciao ciao. Grazie. Ciao ragazzi, arrivederci. 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 Ar